are in listen-only mode. Hello all, my name is Steve Minnie and I'm the Senior Director of Applications for the AFM Business Unit. And I'd like to welcome you to this installment of the Bruker AFM webinar series. This presentation is titled, In Situ Study of Solid Electrolyte Interface Using Peak Force Tapping Mode, AFM, in a Glove Box. It's presented by uh, a group of collaborators, starting with Xinqing Xiao of General Motors Global R&D, and then Chunzing Li from Bruker, and finally, Anton Tokranov from Brown University. But before I introduce the speaker panel, I'd like to make a few quick logistical comments. First, we encourage your participation during the webinar, and if you have a question, please type it into the questions dialog box on your screen. We'll accumulate these questions through the presentation and group them together, and then answer them all at the end of the prepared remarks. Quite often, we have more questions than we can answer, and in those cases, we will follow up uh, with you directly in an email afterwards. Also, if you'd like to review the presentation afterwards or pass it on to a colleague, the webinar will be posted on online. Uh, this will be in the webinar section of the Bruker webpage, and we'll also email you uh, a direct link uh, to that recording. And finally, when you exit the webinar, you'll, you'll be asked to take a brief survey, and I would uh, very much appreciate it if you could uh, take the time to answer uh, the, the few questions that we have. We use this to help pick topics for future webinars, and uh, we think it generally makes the series much better. So let's get started, and uh, let me introduce uh, our presenters. Uh, first speaking uh, is Dr. Uh, Xinxing Xiao, who obtained his PhD from the Chinese Academy of Sciences and then spent one year at the Technical University of Munich in Germany uh, as an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow. After that, he worked as a research associate at Argonne National Lab and then Brown University before joining GM Global R&D Center in 2006. He's published more than 80 peer-reviewed papers and has 21 awarded patents and 30 patent applications in a variety of fields. He'll kick off the presentation with an overview of the subject, and then uh, Dr. Chunzing Li of Bruker will speak. Uh, Chunzing received his PhD in physical chemistry in 1993 from Xiamen University in China under the supervision of Zhao Wu Qian on developing one of the first systems. He did postdocs at Beijing University and Florida International University before joining at the time Vico, which is now Bruker, uh, and that was in 2000. While at Bruker, he's led the product and application developments of pretty much all of the Bruker uh, EC and nanoelectric products. Uh, Chun Zing has, spent, has 19 years of AFM experience and 23 peer-reviewed publications and uh, one patent. And then our third speaker will be Anton uh, Trokhanov. Uh, talking about uh, most of the, the work done with the AFM. He received his Bachelor of Science in Material Science from Johns Hopkins University in 2009 uh, and continued his education uh, at Brown University Engineering Department in Material Science. He's currently working on in-situ stress and AFM measurements and battery electrodes for both carbon and silicon with a focus on SCI formation. And so with that, let me now turn it over to uh, Dr. Xinxing Shaw. Uh, to kick the talk, the, this talk off, again, which is titled In-Situ Study of Solid Electrical Light Interface Using Peak Force Tapping in a Glove Box. Xin Xing. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the uh, introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. So um, first of all, I would like to uh, take a couple of minutes uh, to introduce the background, why we are interested in this technology. Uh, so. Um, So, um, so as you know, lithium ion batteries uh, used in the electric vehicles could be one of the uh, most promising solutions um, to solve the sustainability and also the energy independence in the U.S. So, comparing with other types of batteries and fuel cells, uh, because of uh, a list of advantages here, so I will not give a detailed explanation. Um, Although, like the lithium ion batteries uh, are very promising, but the uh, chemical and the mechanical degradations are still the main issues uh, in order to satisfy the like, 10 years life and the 5,000 cycles requirements for the uh, electric vehicle application. 
So before uh, further uh, discussing the degradation, uh, let's take a look at how the lithium ion battery works. So here is our uh, battery cells. And it consists of two electrodes, um, positive and negative uh, electrodes here, and a polymer uh, separator uh, between them. And uh, here you have the electrode light here as well. So the lithium ion transport back and forth between these two electrodes through the electrode light and the electrons will transport uh, uh, through the external circuits uh, during the charge and discharging process. So uh, the, uh, in this cell, a lot of undesirable side reactions happen there, uh, which are responsible for the chemical and the mechanical uh, degradation. So the chemical degradation, such as un unstable uh, and solid electrolyte interface, or SEI, form the on both electric surface, as shown uh, here. Um, also, the gas generation uh, due to the side reaction happen on the electrode surface. If you are using a positive electrodes in the uh, cells, so it may also have the uh, manganese distribution problem, which will uh, the dissolved uh, manganese ions will um, um, migrate through the electrolyte through the separator and deposit on the uh, surface of the negative electrodes, which damage the SCI. So, in for the mechanical degradation, particularly for the electrodes with high capacities, um, uh, it will cause a diffusion-induced stress that uh, leads to the material fatigue crack and fracture. So, you form the new fracture surface, you form SCI here as well. So, as you can see, most of the uh, degradation mechanism are really related with the failure of the solid e electrolyte interface. So then uh, leads to the low current efficiency and a short battery life. So uh, um, Professor Martin uh, Winter gave a nice uh, review on the sort of the electrical interface. The title probably um, uh, based represents the understanding on the SCI layer. So the most uh, important but the least understood uh, SCI in the chargeable lithium ion batteries. Uh, so the SGI, in fact, is a um, perturbation layer formed on the electrolyte uh, interface, and it's a product uh, from the electrolyte decomposition. Why it's important? Because it's really a determinant factor uh, on the performance of the battery cells. Then it can affect the cycle life, power capability, shelf life, and safety. And so the, info, uh, the formation of appropriate SEI is really an essential and a critical step uh, trying to, if you want to get better uh, battery performers. So a lot of technologies has, uh, have been applied to um, understand the uh, SEI layer, like chemical composition, um, such as XPS, uh, top seams, uh, FTIR, Raman. Um, so the main components in SCI uh, are listed here. Then includes this uh, lithium carbonate, lithium fluoride, lithium oxide, and other organic compounds. So um, the chemical composition can be different from different reports, as you can see uh, the list of the interior here. That really depends on many factors such as uh, electrolyte additives, surface coatings and the surface chemistry of the electrodes. Uh, although more and more results have been reported regarding the chemical composition, however, this uh, work has been done to understand the mechanical properties uh, of SCI. So why that is important? Um, so particularly for the high capacity electrode, uh, so larger amount of lithium will be inserted into this electrodes, and then we will generate the crack and the new fracture surface. So you form a new SCI, you consume lithium there. Um, for the automotive applications, we have to sacri uh, we have to meet the requirements of five sound cycles. So if you uh, have like 99 percent of, like of uh, efficiency, you can only reach 430 cycles and uh, when your capacity will reduce to 80 percent. Even you have 99.99 percent of efficiency, you can still not sen uh, satisfy the requirement for five thousand cycles. So the uh, main um, factor responsible for then low efficiency is the uh, 
or ACI, unstable ACI from the during the cycling. Um, so this is critical important for the silicon based electrodes because silicon although it has high uh, ten times higher capacity uh, than graphite, but it also has up to three hundred percent of warming expansion and contraction during the cycling. So make, that makes uh, most of the ACI unstable. Um, so it has no current efficiency and short battery life. So Martin Winter gave a nice uh, schematic drawing to show how the uh, ACI will feel on the like silicon-based uh, electrodes. So how can we control the ACI layer, uh, which can stand such huge volume uh, change during the cycling? So we believe that first we have to understand um, how the ACI feel uh, on this particular on the silicon. Um, so um, and also, uh, how can we really correlate the current efficiency with the mechanical properties? Do we need the ACI to be soft or is it to be rich in, or, uh, in order to accommodate the huge volume expansion? And how can we really develop an appropriate artificial uh, ACI layer? So do we need the ACI to be rich, uh, to be rich to constrain the volume expansion, or do we need it to be soft to accommodate the volume expansion? So to answer those questions, we really need a, a, a tool to really in situ characterize the uh, behavior of the ACI during the cycling. So I believe that the, um, uh, the uh, in situ the next chemical AFM can provide such capability to do that. So with that, I will uh, give this to uh, Chen Zhen. Please. So I will introduce a little bit about the uh, AFM technique we are going to use in this study. That is the peak force tapping mode. I want to give you a little perspective about peak force tapping mode versus in the AFM system. The first AFM mode is contact mode. And we know in relation to the first curve, we know it uh, works at a some point, at a point somewhere in the repulsive force region. So during image, you are actually kind of sliding the tip across the surface. And you feed back on the, uh, on the repulsive force to get the topography and get the friction. So when you slide the tip across the surface, it exerts some lateral force. And sometimes this lateral force is not desirable. And then came uh, tapping mode where you are oscillating the AFM cantilever so during the, at the resonance frequency. And during this oscillation, the tip actually is going through the, um, the uh, uh, no force region, uh, attractive force region, and repulsive force region. However, tapping mode is feeding back on the amplitude which is affected by the convoluted force. And from there, if you feedback on the amplitude, you get topography and a phase. About three years ago, peak force tapping mode was introduced. So I would say it's, um, it's a, it has this duality. It's like contact mode, and also it's like tapping mode. So first, the cantilever is, is modulated like in tapping mode, however, at a off resonance frequency, usually a few kilohertz. So the tip is still being driven to or from the surface. And it's going through this uh, attractive force region and repulsive force region. In that, it's like tapping mode. And also, it's like a contact mode. So when the tip is brought into the surface, and it, and it, it, it can be in contact with the surface. And the maximum interaction force, which is the peak force, is controlled and it's used as a feedback signal to get the topography of the surface. 
of the surface. But it's not, you can also say it's neither contact mode nor tapping mode. In that first, it can control the force directly and more accurately. It can control the force down to tens of picoNewton. Pico and also it's unique in its own right. During a scan, at each pixel, we get a complete force distance curve. And from this force distance curve, quite a bit can be learned about the mechanical properties of the sample. For example, when, you, when the tip is approaching to the surface and under the interaction force, it can cause the sample to deform. And from the deformation of the sample, you can learn the hardness of the sample. And from the slope of this retractive retract branch, you can learn the stiffness of the sample. There you get elastic modulus of the sample. At the tip, it's pulling off the surface. You can see here you can measure the adhesion, which is from the deep into the baseline of the force. And you, that tells you the thickness of the sample. And all those mechanical properties are measured quantitatively. This is uh, the so-called peak force Q and M, quantitative nanomechanical property mapping. So now you see the power of this peak, for, peak force tapping mode. We desire to make this mode available and suitable for lithium battery work. The first thing we did is to put this AFM in a glove box. The, the idea is very simple, straightforward. The effort is, however, non-trivial. We need to take care of vibration and acoustic noise. For example, a active vibration isolation table is put underneath this AFM, and the glove box is uh, customized to support this structure to reduce uh, vibration. And so the other thing is we need to bring all those signals in and out of this glove box. That is to, we need to build fit through cables so we don't compromise all the functionality and we, without, uh, com uh, without the com compromising uh, the seal of the glove box. The next thing is we need a electrochemical cell, a EC cell that's suitable for lithium battery work. So here you see the setup, you see the AFM pad there, and you see the EC cell and the chuck, the EC chuck. And for on the EC chuck, there's a heater that allows you to heat up the sample to 65 degrees from room temperature, and the EC cell there. Now, for the EC cell, the first thing we uh, must consider is, since for lithium battery, uh, the solvent used is organic. It's uh, carbonate, organic carbonate solvent. So all the materials that are maybe in contact with the electrolyte must be chemically compatible. So that's why the glass, uh, calrest, or uh, Teflon, or Kelf are being used uh, to construct this EC cell. The other thing is organic solvent tend to be very evaporative. And also charging or discharging a battery can take a long time, many hours, for example. So in order to carry out a full experiment and without the uh, solvent uh, uh, dress up, the cell must be closed. So on the left, you can see on the top, that's the uh, cantilever holder. And when the cantilever and the tip is there, so it goes through this glass cover uh, the hole in the glass cover, and then when the tip is engaged on the surface, it closes the cell. The, the rubber boot seals around this glass hole, so it's sealed. That allows you to 
um, uh, uh, the solvent to stay there for many hours days, actually. So now I'll show you an actual setup about the cell. Here is a graphite uh, anode. And you see the, uh, lithium foil are being used as a counter and reference electrode. So that's uh, about the setup. All right, uh, I'm going to try to go through some of the experimental results we've got using this uh, setup. So from experiments, SCI on silicon uh, is kind of, it's very difficult to stabilize. Uh, one of the most important problems is silicon expansion uh, causes a large amount of stress in the surface of SCI. So from literature, there's still been some reports of silicon expansion up to 400% if you go all the way down uh, into Lithium silicon. Uh, so, how do you solve this problem? If you uh, look at the some of the possible solutions, so first is if you deposit uh, some kind of inorganic or organic SEI, which actually might be able to accommodate uh, this expansion. But as far as we know, most of the SEIs, organic SEIs, do not have uh, good passivating qualities. On the other hand, inorganic SEIs. Uh, are not able to sustain this kind of expansion. So what we actually developed uh, in Brown is a model of electrode, which is a silicon uh, island deposited on the surface. Uh, silicon island deposited on the surface, which uh, works along the lines of uh, silicon, uh, which, uh, which when lithiated, exp expands reversibly on the surface. So the idea is we formed SCI on top of the island, and when it's cycling, uh, it will most likely test the ICI and see if it can accommodate the expansion. Um, so uh, we actually have the paper in the island, so if you look it up later, but well, this is look at this is what the island looked like during cycling. So on this island, the SCI is already formed. But as we cycle, uh, you can see that the expansion of the island causes new surface area to open up and SCI to form. So when it contracts back, that uh, SCI remains on the surface and is uh, forms irreversibly on the surface. So, for example, as you can see here, there's peaking in the size, which is what happened, which is due to SCI formation. So, one more. It's going to go one more time. There we go. And so, this is just opens up a brand new area and consumes lithium irreversibly, which is something that you want to avoid if you want to uh, increase capacity. Uh, so, other uh, problems, uh, other problems with electrodes could be mechanical fractures shown above, or some uh, other some other unknowns. For example, we in one experiment we saw some form of whiskering. So there's lots of uh, uh, problems trying to figure out how to get these electrodes to function. So uh, our current efforts are to understand SEI formation. Uh, in a more controlled way. So first, uh, we decide we go to thin film model films. Uh, this allows us for easier to understand the um, mechanical properties of the material. So from this, we can do a in situ AFM because uh, flat electrodes are a lot easier to scan uh, in the AFM. Uh, second, we can do uh, in situ stress studies, which is a specialty from Brown. Uh, and uh, last, we can also do some complementary experiments. For example, TEM, which we actually started recently. Uh, followed by Simpson XPS uh, and coin cells. So one of the reasons why this is good is because if you look at the thin film configuration, uh, this is equivalent to looking straight down from the surface of the particle into the particle. Uh, this allows for uh, easy interpretation, easy interpretation of the data. Uh, so for these experiments, uh, we are uh, doing uh, the following uh, approach. We're uh, uh, we actually to the lithography patterns the surface to show both silicon islands and copper in the same scan. 
what this allows us to do is use copper, which is known to form a controlled SEI. So if there's been a decent amount of work showing what how copper SEI forms and how it behaves. I, and we use that as reference to silicon ions. So uh, for uh, this set of experiments, we used uh, several uh, model films of silicon uh, deposited through E-beam uh, on top of copper, which is also deposited through E-beam on a SiO2 substrate. Um, in this case, uh, we will use two electrolytes. One is, uh, is one molar LIP of 6 in ECTMC, uh, which was shipped from GM. And uh, another is the perchlorate we mixed at Broker. Um, so both of, the, uh, both of these electrolytes have no additives. We also used uh, alumina uh, to play some clever schemes and trying to figure out how to suppress SCI formation and look at uh, some of the properties. Uh, one of the, uh, so the ions were formed using the lithography procedure, which is a uh, standard, we, uh, standard uh, if a bit crude uh, way we did a uh, uh, version of the Mike Trotronics one. Uh, so what we did is just have a, uh, a side to substrate with copper deposit on our top surface. We spin the spin coat of photo resist and then expose the uh, mask through pattern to uh, UV light, which in this case uh, allows uh, some of the photos is to be washed off uh, using the developer, and then we sputter through it, uh, creating uh, SEI or creating pattern, a silicon pattern. Uh, one of the problems with this method is uh, because of the way we deposit. So silicon uh, tends to deposit uh, uh, very uh, on every surface available. So because of this, we actually have uh, significant sidewalls. Uh, we also know that these sidewalls, when they form, have some uh, properties that prevent them from sliding. So I think we have uh, some, uh, some photo resist uh, on the surf or near the edge which prevents sliding of the islands. Which in this, uh, for our purposes is uh, good so because we actually have a look at the thin film with only uh, Z expansion. Uh, so this is the sample electrode cycle. So you can see the copper which is what we used for control at the high measurements and then the silicon. Uh, so in this talk, we'll talk about irreversible uh, silicon expansion, uh, SCI formation using, uh, including copper SCI and then some thickness strongness properties, uh, some SCI mechanical properties, and possibly depending on time, silicon diffusion. So one of the first uh, things we did when we started these set of experiments is look at uh, copper SCI. So what we did is we patterned copper the same way we do silicon. So on copper, we deposited more copper in island form. And on top of that, we did reactive sputtering of alumina. So um, alumina has been known to uh, prevent SEI formation by blocking electroconductivity uh, as well as uh, uh, preventing lithium diffusion through the material depending on the thickness. Uh, in this case, we deposited reasonably thick uh, 5 nanometers, which should prevent most of the SEI formation. And then uh, when we look at this difference between these two, uh, with the copper, which is untreated, and the alumina coated uh, subsurface, we're able to determine uh, the SCI formation on the material. One of the, so from this, we find out that uh, when we load the cell pretty early on, once uh, we apply uh, potential, there's a pretty uh, quick response, and they form SCI uh, on the surface of copper. Uh, on the roughness of approx or approximately 20 nanometers. As we cycle, uh, the SCI does not have uh, very many, uh, we have, uh, very much variation in height. It might be plus or minus 5 nanometers, but overall the thickness seems to remain uh, very similar. Uh, next, uh, we're going to take a look at the uh, silk, irreversible silk expansion. So in, in this case, uh, one of our samples was coated entirely with the alumina, with the rex sputtery alumina, uh, approximately 10 nanometers. And this will prevent SEF formation on top of the silicon and copper. So we're just looking at the height of the island then. Uh, so in this case, uh, you can have a diffusion going through the side of the island, which is un, uh, uncoated. So uh, from this uh, table, you can see the result uh, that during recreation, silicon expands to about 170, 180 nanometers, which is approximately 306% of the original volume. Uh, this is from going from 1.5 volts to 50 millivolts. So this is before crystalline transition. 
uh, and the material was amorphous originally. So this is amorphous uh, silicon uh, going to uh, lithiate amorphous silicon. Uh, and then when we do lithiate this material, and we actually do this several times, we weigh it all out, we actually get the final volume around 70 nanometers, 20 plus the original volume, which uh, implies is that the silicon actually irreversibly expanded uh, to, uh, about 140%. Uh, this is consistent with what uh, others uh, people predicted and saying that uh, first the uh, um, amorphous, there's a change in the amorphous structure uh, of the material. And then a uh, second possibility, there's voice space. There's been reported, uh, reports of the same uh, in different other materials. Uh, now we're going to SEI formation. So because we can isolate the silicon expansion, we can now look at the SEI formation in the electrode. So first, uh, if you look at the cycling, uh, we slowly uh, do, we do this through voltage steps, and we go down to uh, 1.5 volts to uh, 0.9 volts, and we see no formation of SEI at this point. But when we go to 0.6, you know, this is still above the lithiation potential. So there should be no uh, lithium going into the silicon. But at the same time, you see, have a significant growth in height. This corresponds to SEI formation. Uh, with the continued lithiation uh, at 0.3 volts, and the SEI continues to grow, as well as silicon lithiating, uh, which then peaks out to around 200 nanometers, somewhere around between 200 and 220. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, this was a, a rather interesting electrode in the sense that uh, the SCI had different uh, morphology depending on how far from the edge this was. Uh, we don't have an explanation for this, but if you look at the average overall height, it can be seen that uh, SCI near the, the edge and further away from the edge have approximately the same uh, profile if you average the height. So just the roughness of the surface changes. Uh, now, one of the things we were able to do is we repeated the same experiment at Brown and did some TEM to confirm that this is actually what is happening. Uh, so what we did see is approximately um, a silicon, uh, it does have an expansion of volume to about 20 nanometers as we've seen in experiments. Uh, it goes to see an SEI, which is slightly thinner. Uh, there could be several reasons for this. One, it could be some damage during the uh, lift out of the sample. It could also be that during uh, when we took out the sa uh, sample out of the cell and washed the surface off, some of the electrolyte might have come off uh, through rough treatment. Uh, so from all of this, it does correspond well. And then we actually did EDS on this sample as well. So the profile matches up very well. And you can see that uh, as you, uh, you can see the copper uh, has an uh, interface to silicon, which then has uh, SEI. And now the interesting thing is the SEI has a good amount of platinum a penetration into it, so that implies that surface of the SCI might be porous. Um, so if we move on to a different electrolyte, so this is uh, perchlorate uh, that was mixed at Brooker and ECDs. Uh, so first thing to note is uh, there's also SCI formation also begins at 0.6 uh, volts, uh, and you can see a large increase in height. Uh, this corresponds to large SEI formation, which believes to be probably mostly organic at that potential. Uh, the sample then cycle, and you can see the expansion uh, in the electrode. Um, and on the deletiation, the volume restricts. But one thing, interesting thing to note is the volume keeps going down after the uh, sample is being held at 1.5 volts. Uh, this implies that the uh, uh, this uh, probably means that the SCI formed on this is not very stable and actually has some degradation at least in the first cycle. Uh, one other thing to note is uh, one other thing to note is the uh, uh, roughness of the SCI. So uh, Electro, uh, for both of the electrolytes, if we look at the average roughness, it starts at about 0.6 volts when the SEI starts to form. But both the electrodes level off to approximately the same value. So approximately uh, 50 nanometer roughness is what you get for both electrolytes, while copper remains more or less constantly smooth. So 
does this mean that there is a certain preference for morphology? We're still trying to figure this out, but it does look like uh, organic STI has preference, certain preference for uh, roughness. Now, one other capability we would have to this, instead of having a uh, resolution per scan, we decided to try to see if we can analyze the data uh, by looking individually at every scan and seeing if we can uh, see SCI growth in situ in second resolution. So what we have here is the scan going down. So this was a transition 0.9 volts to 0.6 volts. And uh, this scan is uh, fi uh, 512 lines in uh, X direction and 128 lines in, the Z, or in the Y direction. So by averaging this area between these two uh, lines, we can actually look at the average rough or average height at given time with a resolution of a couple of seconds. Uh, so we can see that the height is slowly increasing as the electrode cycle as well as roughness. And you can continue, uh, in this case the scan is going up in the, and you can see the uh, trend continues. So as you are uh, looking at the electrode, the actually height keeps growing. Um, so what this actually looks like, if you add up several of these scans and just plot them all on the same axis, is the following. So you can see that the trend is as uh, the thickness is slowly increasing uh, with a slightly upward trend. Uh, this is true for both near the edge and near the center. Uh, so both of these follow approximately the same trend with the near the center might be slightly rougher. Um, for the purposes of analysis, we use the smoother surface because it's easier, it's easier to interpret and uh, it's, uh, this is uh, easier to compare to data. Uh, if, all, if you compare stress in it, it should actually give you a slightly higher value, which is uh, at the upper limit to what the stress in the material is. So I'm going to do a quick mention. So Ed Brown, our, our specialty is looking at in situ uh, stress measurements. I won't go into too much detail at this, but the technique relies on using an in situ cell to look at the wafer curvature during cycling of a thin film. Um, there's references to this done about 15 years. This was developed about 15 years ago, and we just uh, transferred this to uh, batteries, uh, electrodes. Um, but what this does give us is the ability to look at stress or derive stress from uh, wafer curvature. So the important thing is, so one of the experiments we did at Brown is uh, has electrode with exactly the same cycling as we've done for these uh, uh, FM experiments. So what you can see is that uh, response is completely flat for the first uh, from 1.5 and 0.9 volts. But as you hit uh, 0.6 volts, you can see a very significant stress response. So we, uh, I, this means that SEI has a, a certain growth stress. So the cool thing is, when we plot this uh, with a height profile, which we do, uh, derived in the previous slide, we can see that uh, it matches up very, very nicely to what we've seen uh, in the AFM. So this means two things. One is that these two techniques are actually uh, compatible and give you the complementary information to each other. So uh, it's, uh, it also allows us to extract certain value out of this, uh, uh, certain numbers out of this data. So we have approximately 5 gigapascal nanometers grown in 30 minutes which with approximately 16 nanometers growth at the same time. So uh, that gives you approximately uh, 80 MPa growth stress, which is a reasonable value in uh, dense organic material. One other thing to note is that as you look at the curve, you can see that there's a slight upward trend, meaning that as you go further, uh, the, stre the, uh, the stress and the height increases uh, slightly. Um, this can be explained by increasing surface area of the electrode, as you can see that, and this is corresponds to the current as well. So as the current levels off, and then as you keep uh, the hold going for longer, you can see that the current actually starts to slightly increase, meaning that the surface area might cause higher uh, SCI formation. Um, so now I'll go a quick uh, discussion of some mechanical properties we observe. So, uh, in the same electrode, during the same scan, we also observe some uh, basic mechanical properties. So, uh, as uh, as Chen Zhang explained uh, earlier, you can see that the, uh, we are able to measure some modulus data. So, 
as you can see in the beginning of the scan, the modulus is a reasonably high value, uh, which is uh, somewhere around, uh, we, have, we measure around 60 MPa for the surface. But as we cycle, we can see that the trend is decreasing pretty rapidly. And in about five minutes, we're, uh, the modulus is down to a low value. Uh, this is consistent with the deformation. This is a mound that uh, we're able to penetrate into the electrode with a, with a weapon we press on it. So as you can see, that the, uh, the uh, value levels off to about 6 nanometers. So what we're probably seeing is that there's an organic forming on the surface of the electrode, uh, probably a porous organic because of the mod low modulus value, uh, which is uh, approximately gives us a sense that of the top 6 nanometers of the electrode are probably uh, reasonably soft porous organic. So we could go uh, explore this electrode further and get more accurate stress or uh, modulus values by applying more force, which would damage the SCI. But uh, so at this point we didn't want to do this because we wanted to just get the high profile. But in further experiments we can apply more force and actually see what's underneath this wave and get some mechanical properties of that. Um, another experiment which we found very interesting is for the perchlorate electrolyte. Uh, so using the same technique, uh, we can see that uh, while Usually it forms an organic surface pretty quickly, which holds off for most of uh, the time. But when you get 50 millivolts, we have a rapid rise in the modulus. So over the course of uh, 30 minutes, the modulus basically increased by an order of magnitude. Uh, this implies the, that there is some form of uh, inorganics forming on the surface of the electrode. Um, and you can see that as you cycle later on, uh, the inorganic does not go away. So that means that during the first cycle there are significant changes in the uh, electrode depending on, on, uh, depending on uh, how you cycle it or in, like, uh, what the uh, electrolyte is. So to summarize some of the data we achieved is uh, we have approximately, uh, we observe approximately 360 percent expansion uh, of the silicon electrode with about 140 uh, percent of volume being irreversible. Uh, with copper SEI being approximately 20 nanometers. Uh, the SEI for uh, ECE was approximately 70 nanometers with much thicker on per corridor electrode. Uh, for mechanical properties, we observed a significant SEI at 0.6 volts, uh, which remained on the surface throughout the experiment. Uh, while on per corridor, we have an uh, increase in surface modulus at low potential, signifying more inorganic SEI forming at that uh, one other thing I want to quickly mention uh, is during uh, our cycling of our samples, for alumina coated sample, we got some interesting information, up to, uh, mostly by luck, that we have a very low controlled electrode. So as we look at this electrode, this is the silicon component, and lithium is not able to go through the top, only through the side. Because of the such large uh, uh, x-y distance that has to traverse, uh, we have a very low, uh, very low controlled uh, experiment where we can see the diffusion profile going into the silicon. So what this looks like is this. Uh, as you can see, uh, if you just look at individual scans, you can see that the profile is slowly moving forward. Uh, and from this, we can actually get some interesting diffusion information into silicon. Uh, so there is possibly some interference from uh, the electro, uh, for, uh, from interfaces, so copper, uh, silicon interface and copper alumina interface might be able to affect an increased diffusion or decreased diffusion depending on uh, its, their properties. But we do get uh, some basic diffusion values just by doing some uh, simple fits to approximately uh, 2 times 10 to negative 10 uh, diff uh, diffusion in uh, centimeters per second diffusion in silicon. Uh, so from this, I would probably like to conclude and say that this, uh, this, uh, uh, this collaboration allowed us to look at the SEI formation of battery electrodes, uh, including some uh, uh, properties during cycling uh, and difference between electrolytes. So we should be able to also use this technique to look at the difference between additives, so what kind of changes they cause to the surface, uh, as well as mechanical properties of the surface region. Uh, with possibly deeper, uh, uh, you can have some properties of the whole overall electrode if you use uh, play around, uh, if you play around with some uh, the force applied, in, uh, there might be some damage to the electrode or to the SCI at that point. But it might give us some interesting information. And then the lastly, if you carefully uh, calibrate or uh, examine your electrodes, you can possibly set up experiments that give you 
uh, diffusion information for the material. I, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you uh, very much uh, uh, to all three of uh, the speakers. Again, uh, Shen Cheng Xiao uh, from GM, uh, Chen Zing Li from Bruker, uh, and Anton uh, Tokranov uh, from uh, Brown. Uh, so if you have questions, please uh, enter them into the questions dialog box. It should be on the uh, right side of your screen and uh, we will make uh, every attempt uh, to answer them. We have uh, a number of questions on uh, a variety uh, of different topics, and so I will try to uh, group them together uh, and go through them in that order. It looks like they're coming in in uh, sort of three main uh, categories, uh, questions on the, on the experiments uh, themselves, uh, questions on instrumentation, and then sort of application to, uh, to other, uh, other topics. Um, so let's uh, let's just get started with the the first one. Uh, the the question is um, on the the work about determining the chemical nature of the uh, SEI. You use techniques uh, that were uh, much uh, larger um, and not the AFM. The the question is is there an opportunity to get chemical uh, information using an AFM technique? I guess uh, uh, Anton, maybe that's uh, that might be a good good question. Question. Well, for you. so uh, one thing we can probably do using AFM is since this um, to, uh, AFM is able to measure mechanical properties of the uh, of the SEI, if you measure cur uh, correlate the mechanical properties to uh, to actual mechanical values for the material for the possible material, you can get uh, some information about the chemical composition. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think maybe some of the other techniques that people are thinking of uh, might be uh, difficult in the uh, in the EC cell, for example, TERS or, or others. Um, so yeah, I think that that's a good segue to some of these mechanical questions. Uh, one is, uh, did the viscosity of the electrolyte influence your measurement? So I'll, <coughs> this turns out to cover that question. Uh, I think, uh, yes. Um, Actually, we are working on to uh, take that into consideration to make the uh, measurement in different uh, media more accurate. So that's still ongoing effort. I would say, you know, in comparison with uh, measurement in air, um, uh, I mean, it's more complex. Okay. So uh, following that on, uh, this came in for the mechanical uh, properties. Um, as you measure the hardness, what were the conditions uh, of your tip? And that also ties into a couple questions on what tip you are using and how do you keep uh, uh, lithium from intercalating into the tip. So it sounds like people are curious about the, the tip. Um, I think that's a very uh, good uh, question. Uh, so first on the intercalation into the tip, the tip itself is not a conduction, so there is no electrical path to the to the tip area. So uh, it shouldn't uh, inter intercalation to the tip shouldn't happen. However, however, when the tip touches the surface, it may get a uh, uh, get some. Um, uh, it may it may be become part of the sample. In that case, uh, it may happen. So. Yeah, that's the case for the, the tip interpolation. And for the mechanical properties, uh, generally the tip material has to be uh, uh, harder to, has to have higher modulus than the sample, that's one. And also the spring constant of the liver has to be high enough to to see um, the mechanical properties for the sample. Um, okay. And as well? Yes, please. Uh, so I also thought about this for a while, and if you look at the modulus values we're getting, because we're using such a low force, uh, most of the time, that even if, if you have a fully lithiated silicon, it'll still be harder than most SEI materials. Uh, second, I think uh, if the, I believe the uh, cantilever for this tip is uh, uh, nitride, actually. So that's one other thing to add. Okay. So what, what specific tips were, were you using for this, uh, for this study? 
it's a scan assist of fluid plus. Okay. Okay. Um, how did you make connection uh, to the uh, electrode, and do you feel that this is a good analog for uh, the operational conditions in the battery? So the electrode, uh, so the electrode was uh, connected. So from the top, uh, so the O-ring actually goes on top of the wafer, uh, and the electrode is made outside of that wafer. So it's a top-down, press-down onto the uh, copper that is the surface of the wafer. Um, the only difference between the actual cell is there might be uh, there, there's more electrode used because in tissue you have to actually co uh, cover the entire surface. So the only real difference between uh, this electrode and an uh, actual battery is the amount of electrode. Okay. Um, so I guess this is maybe a bit of a, a follow-up to the, the previous question and uh, tie in to the, uh, the electrical connection. Uh, but if the uh, tip is non-conducting, how did you obtain the current measurements? So I'll pick up that question. Um, actually, the current measurement is not it's not through the tip, it's the uh, total current through the cell, through the, uh, the anode. So it's not local current from the AFM tip. Right. Okay. Um, how was the alumina deposited on the silica? And uh, so what alumina was deposited through reactive sputtering, so it was just aluminum target uh, sputtered in oxide, oxygen heavy atmosphere. Okay. And uh, was the effect of changing the alumina thickness investigated? Uh, it was not for this study. There's other papers done on coin cell based experiments. Uh, we, have, we didn't have uh, the, capability or the time to do all of these experiments in AFN. Okay, and then I, I think I recall you said that it was uh, five nanometers thickness that you chose, and, and uh, that we actually you chose uh, for 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 silicon we chose uh, ten nanometers because that would completely block off any it should it should completely prevent electroconductivity and shouldn't have any uh, what uh, changes during lithiation. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears here uh, a little bit in, in our remaining time and get to some of the other, uh, other topics. There are additional questions in, but um, th there's actually quite a few on, uh, on the actual uh, process of the measurement um, itself. So, for example, can you do uh, an impedance analysis with this technique? So, uh, we haven't done that, but in principle, yes. So it's an electrochemical cell, and if if you hook up to a uh, to a potential stat that has this uh, EIS capability, you should should be able to do it. But that will be on the whole surface, as uh, it's not of a local impedance from the tip. Again, uh, the tip is not uh, uh, conductive in this case. Okay, um, I think that. You may have answered it here, but I'll, I'll ask it. Can conductive AFM replace EC uh, in this experiment? That will require a conductive tip uh, with only the very end exposed and the rest uh, isolated. In that case, you could do uh, ERS in situ. Or if you just want to look at uh, ERS uh, um, ex situ, then um, then yes, you can just use conductive tip to do that. Okay, so so it is possible, but not in the. Uh, it, it's possible, but the equipment really isn't available. Right, it's possible, but not readily available. Okay. Um, did the electrolytes interfere with the laser? I guess is is the are the electrolytes opaque or have any sort of index uh, property? I would say not at all. That's not a concern. Okay. Uh, how is the working electrode connected? Uh, as uh, Anton has already pointed out, uh, the, in his case, uh, the the electric connection to the connection to the working electrode is outside of the cell. So you have, uh, let's say, you have the copper layer on the on on the sample on on the glass slide, and then you use a clip to um, make connection to the top field. 
Copperfield. It's outside of the cell. The connection is not in contact with the electrolyte. OK. Um, so, so here's a question where uh, it's, it's uh, speculating that the measurement was done in cross-section. And uh, could you give more details about the cleavage? Uh, I think that may be asking about the TEM uh, rather than the AFM, which I don't believe was done in cross-section. But maybe, Anton, could you just clarify that uh, quickly? So this is actually is a cross-section. Uh, we did a FIP lift out on the, uh, on the sample. So we cut away from both sides and pinned the sample using uh, focused iron beam. OK. So I have a question for you then. Where the platinum is from in your cross-section image? Uh, we deposited it, so it's uh, we usually what I actually try to do is uh, you have a platinum rich gas which when hit with uh, either gallium ions or electrons actually decomposes or and it deposits platinum on the surface, and we did that on top so first electron beam then uh, ion beam to prevent preserve the surface, and that's what we see at the surface. There's a marker layer you deposit in the tip. Okay, thanks. Okay. And then a follow-up to that question just came in. Uh, did the ion beam of the FIB cause damage to the SCI? Uh, from previous experiments we tried, it should be minimal. But there's always a possibility that this is the case. But we try to minimize it by using uh, electron deposited with platinum first, which should cause uh, less damage than ion beam deposited with platinum. OK. Um, I think that this uh, question relates to the, the time studies. Uh, can the fast scan be used to get full images of SEI formation or to capture diffusion rather than doing line scans? Uh, I would take that as a good suggestion uh, so far. Uh, fast scan is not uh, made available to EC work yet, but that's really a good point especially for dy dynamic processes like this. OK. So we have a couple minutes left. I'll try to get uh, some of these, these questions in. Uh, this group is mostly about uh, different, uh, different systems. Um, so the, here the question is, in the introduction, you introduced graphite, uh, but then said silicon is a, a better choice. Um, can you comment? specifically on graphene. So I guess the question is, is, is graphene uh, better than silicon, or is it more similar to, to graphite? Uh, I think that's I can what take this question, like, for the, yeah, uh, so um, for graphene materials, because of this high surface area, you may form a lot of ACI. So the first cycle efficiency could be bad. And uh, like for the <coughs> applications in automotive industry, um, cost is one of the main concerns. So like if you use graphene, probably the cost would be uh, unacceptable. Um, like if you compare graphene or graphite with silicon, I think the graphite is uh, one of the conventional uh, negative electrodes in the lithium ion batteries. And it's quite mature, but the uh, the capacity uh, is uh, low. So um, for the automotive industry, as we want to extend the driving range, um, in order to do that, we have to in, uh, increase the uh, capacity or energy density in the battery cells. So silicon would be one of the choice. But uh, as we pointed out, silicon itself has the intrinsic problem, like the huge volume expansion. So the ACI formula on silicon is a uh, uh, the answer, uh, the ACI formula on silicon could be uh, unstable because of this huge volume expansion. So that's why we are uh, working with the uh, uh, broker trying to use this uh, in situ AFM trying to understand uh, the property and the behavior of the ACI on silicon during the cycling. Uh, so hopefully we can learn something from the end and uh, to further develop stabilized ACI on silicon. OK, great. Thank you. So we're, uh, we're at 9 o'clock here. Uh, we still have a number of questions. So let's do uh, one more question. Uh, and then we will have to follow up uh, with the questions that we didn't, uh, didn't get to uh, offline. Uh, so again, yeah, as you sign off after this last question, please, uh, please complete the survey. Um, 
So again, sort of in the area of other other um, systems, uh, is it possible to obtain the modulus of metal composites specifically for fuel cell materials? I think that's really uh, uh, um, we are really talking about you know what kind of modulus range we can matter. I think for metal or alloy, uh, their modulus are uh, are on the high end of what we can matter. It, um, I would say for now probably it's marginal. Okay. And uh, I guess with that, um, let me uh, thank the, the speakers uh, again, Dr. Shencheng Xiao from uh, General Motors Global R&D, uh, Chen Zing Li from Bruker and Anton uh, Tobranoff uh, from Brown. Uh, again, for their uh, very uh, nice presentation, and also uh, to thank all of you uh, for uh, attending. Uh, and that concludes this uh, this month's webinar. Thanks again. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.